Hi, I'm Tony Williams, a senior fellow with the Bill of Rights Institute, and I am very honored to be having another Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness Scholar Talk. This time, we are very honored to have one of the main, one of the two main editors for the entire resource. Uh, we are so pleased to have Rob McDonald from West Point. Uh, and let me introduce you, Rob. Robert McDonald is a professor of history at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where he has taught since 1998. He's a specialist in the errors of the American Revolution and early American Republic. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia, Oxford University, and UNC at Chapel Hill, where he earned his PhD. He's the author of a fantastic book called Confounding Father, Thomas Jefferson's Image in His Own Time, an editor most recently of Thomas Jefferson's Lives, biography, biographers, and the Battle for History, as well as several other volumes uh, that you've edited on Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he's published articles in numerous scholarly journals, including the Journal of the Early Republic, uh, and he's a great friend of BRI. So Rob, well, welcome very much. And thanks so much, Tony. And I, you know, thank you so much for for uh, lending that Herculean effort uh, over uh, three years to creating life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, your your contribution was was really invaluable. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, it's fantastic that it's finally out. And you know, perusing it and seeing it in its finished form. Um, I have to say, I'm pretty pleased with the job everybody did. I think it's really going to be a valuable resource. Great, great. Well, uh, I, I forget the exact word count, but I, I think you read probably a couple million words uh, <laughs> while you were while you were reviewing everyone's every scholar's work. So, well, why don't we jump right in? So, as I said, Rob, you, you reviewed the the entire resource, uh, a monumental effort. Uh, tell us what you drew you to the project and, and maybe, uh, you know, some of the challenges and rewards along the way of, of uh, helping to review and, and edit an, an entire book and, and project like this. Well, first of all, you know, the Bill of Rights Institute is a fantastic organization. And I, I've worked with you in the past, as you pointed out, and I've always been impressed by the quality um, of the resources that you provide to teachers and through them to their students. So I, I knew it would be good. Um, and I also knew I would learn something. I mean, I, I learned a lot by reading those million words and um, you assembled an all-star cast of historians to write various components of this textbook. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I learned something on every page. So it was really a great experience. Great, great, and and so uh, so that's some of the, some of the rewards and challenges. I mean, it's it's you know um, what you know maybe explain to the the teachers and students viewing, you know what what is it like to work on a project like this? Well, it was time consuming, <laughs> that that is for sure, and um, you know sometimes the deadlines mounted and the uh, chapters stacked up, uh, but Bill of Rights Institute was very patient with me. And, uh, and, and also very, you know, good at reminding me um, of the task at hand. Uh, it, it was interesting to read different accounts by different historians. I mean, you know, you may want to uh, let me talk a little bit about the components of each chapter. Um, you know, each one begins with a fairly lengthy introductory essay, which provides kind of a bird's eye view of a particular era in American history. Um, but then each chapter has about 10 or 15 uh, chapter narratives that are about 1,000 or 1,500 words that um, dive pretty deep into spe specific issues um, and events. Um, there are also decision point uh, essays, which uh, allow readers to get inside the heads of historical figures who had to grapple um, you know, in their real world, in their real time, um, with important you know, dilemmas and considerations. Uh, there are also debates um, that take place in the text between historians, uh, these point counterpoint um, discussions. So those are really interesting, helping people to appreciate um, you know, two or more sides of, of various topics. Um, and of course, there are primary sources and um, you know, ideas for teachers in the classroom. Um, so it's a really full and rich account. And um, you know, reading all those different pieces allowed me um, to 
learn new things, uh, relearn things that, um, that I already knew. Um, and, and also, you know, there were a few points where I came across interpretations that I was not familiar with or, or that didn't, you know, necessarily jive with what I thought I knew. So they caused me to go to the library um, and do a little bit of research. So overall, it was a, a really positive and uh, I, I thought healthy experience for me as a historian. Right, and and some and some ideas and and interpretations that you disagreed with, right? Sure. Uh, and so that was part of the reviewing process. And we had another scholar, Carol Birkin, uh, uh, reviewing the whole thing as well. And we also had individual unit reviewers for every unit, uh, as well as those hunter scholars. We had an internal review of it, um, and we also sent it out some, to some partners. So this is very, very rigorously uh, reviewed uh, by many, many scholars. And, uh, and they, you know, honestly, they just didn't always agree, but that's what makes it history interesting, I think. Uh, and we want the students to model that by thinking for themselves about these, these issues and looking at primary sources and such. And uh, I'll, I'll point out that I ran into Carol about a year ago at a conference, um, and we certainly agreed on just the weight of this source. I mean, there, there are a lot of different pieces to it, a lot of different components to it. And one of the things that I think is so exciting is, well, you know, Carol and I had to read everything. Um, individual teachers can choose which portions, you know, they want to provide to their students. So depending on the, the amount of time that they have at their disposal, depending upon the students' abilities, uh, the amount of reading load that they're comfortable with, um, they can really customize this um, you know, for their own particular classroom. Exactly, they can use one or two pieces, 50 or 60 throughout the year, or just adopt it entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great flexible resource uh, in, in that regard. Okay, well, and, and you've kind of alluded to this already, uh, but how is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness different than, than most other high school or even you know, freshman college level textbooks out there? So I think a big difference, and I think it will be apparent to students even if they don't immediately realize it, a big difference is that a standard textbook written by one or two or three authors purports to be the truth, right? It purports to be the story. It purports to be the narrative. Whereas what the Bill of Rights Institute has put together um, kind of exposes people to the fact that history, and, and this is one of the things that makes history exciting, is that it is very much about interpretation. It's very much about taking the basic facts of history, you know, which usually aren't in dispute, um, but, but then combining them into a narrative that makes sense and, and that you know, con conforms with the individual author's understanding of the truth. And, and we all largely agree on, you know, the basic story of American history. Um, but what gets emphasized um, and, and, and how, you know, different stories are positioned or juxtaposed next to one another, you know, can really affect um, the flavor of history. And I, and I think that it will make students, as well as their teachers, much more thoughtful about that because there are you know, so many you know, diverse and varied viewpoints um, that come through, not only the viewpoints of historical characters, but, but also the viewpoints of modern day historians. Right, fantastic, well said. Um, and and uh, you alluded to uh, the storytelling and narratives. What, what is the importance of good storytelling uh, in, in a history book? Well, you know, I should be asking you that question since you do it so well in, in, in your works. Um, I, I think, look, if, if you can't tell an interesting story in history, you are failing miserably at your job. History is full of interesting stories. You can't make it, it boring, right? If you but, 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 well, you can make it boring. People do make it boring. Um, but fortunately, I don't think any of the people who were participants and collaborators in Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness made it boring. I mean, they really highlighted some of the most essential, some of the most exciting, some of the most controversial, some of the most interesting episodes in American history. And they, they did it with clear writing. Um, they did it with active prose. Uh, they did it with, uh, you know, rich use of quotations, not too much, but, but you know, they allowed people to speak for themselves. Um, and yeah, overall, I, I think it is a truly compelling um, 
textbook, if we even want to call it that. I, I mean, it is. It's a textbook online, um, but it has all these different parts, um, and it is so customizable. And uh, yeah, it just stacks up into something that's, I think, so much more rich than your traditional AP U.S. history textbook. Right. It's really a, a, just a tapestry of different voices really woven together, you know, both historical and, and historians, as, as you said. And we really try to appeal not only to the, the students' intellect, uh, but to their souls as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I think that really comes across throughout, throughout the book. And, and I should point out this too, it is woven together. Um, you know, you and, and the others who sort of brainstormed this concept and, you know, laid out the, uh, the arrangement of the chapters. And I know that you were doing this in accordance with um, the College Board's uh, AP U.S. History standards. But, you know, there are threads that, that connect all of the different chapters. Um, there are issues that are, you know, returned to again and again. So that there really is sort of an, ex an extended and sustained examination of some of the most important themes in American history. Yeah, exactly. And a couple of those would be, you know, what, what is the role of government in our lives? Um, what, is the purpose, what are the purposes of American foreign policy? How have they changed over time? Uh, you know, Americans, humans, relationship to the environment uh, and, and also, you know, the, the economy and, and economic issues keep coming up over and over again. So, yeah, we really try to weave those threads in, but also do a lot of constitutional principles, mm -hmm. uh, point, you know, students back to what it means to be an American uh, and, and civic virtues as well, right? Thinking about citizenship and civic virtues and, and you know, students, uh, you know, within their communities uh, and how have, how have Americans, you know, uh, lived in, in those communities uh, over time as well. So yeah, all very, very critical to that story. So. Well, uh, next question. So uh, think, what are some of the historical skills? Uh, we really emphasize that in, in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What, what historical skills can students learn? I think maybe one of the most uh, important skills that a person can develop through studying history is learning how to be an intelligent uh, consumer of evidence. And you know, one of my favorite pieces of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are the point counterpoint debates. Um, to see two historians, uh, you know, taking sides on you know a specific issue. And by the way. I'm not sure that all the historians necessarily agree with the point that they argue. That's so it's true. very, you know, sportsmanlike of them to uh, to take on this challenge. Um, you have to be able to argue the other side, right? <laughs> you have to, right? I mean, if you understand your position, really, you you need to be able to uh, be able to argue the opposing position. And and so these debates are really spectacular. Um, and students will be able to look at you know two different sides of of an argument. Um, stack them up, uh, you know, look at the quality of the evidence that is um, presented, but also look at the type of the evidence that is presented. You know, some arguments are more qualitative, whereas others are more quantitative. Um, so I really think that it will allow people um, to develop uh, their skills as consumers of information and also, of course, their powers of analysis. Right, and, and two very important skills in today's world, right? Where we have the internet and social media and, and a lot of false claims out there. So uh, how do the students weed through all of that evidence to, to come to a reasonable conclusion about something based upon hard evidence? So yeah, that's right, really yeah. Important. So it's central to what we do as teachers, I think. So, uh, so why do you think reading the stories and hearing the voices of more than 100 different historians, I mean, this is just so unprecedented every time I think of it, is, is important for students instead of that one long grand master narrative? We, we've alluded to it already, but maybe we can come back to that idea. Well, I, I don't want to dehumanize us, our type, our ilk, um, but in a way, all of us historians are filters, right? I mean, we look at the facts of the past um, and we filter them into stories that we produce, into narratives that we produce. Um, and I think we're all honest people. I think we're all trustworthy people. I think we're all well-intentioned people. Um, and yet, you know, two wonderful people, uh, you and me, if we were given the same set of facts and asked to, to write them up into an account, 
um, our accounts would be different. Um, you know, they'd both be awesome and amazing, Tony, but they would be different um, and awesome and amazing in their own ways. So I think it's really useful for teachers and students um, to see historians at work and to see how, um, you know, different people can come to different conclusions um, and to see how people are able to bring their own particular perspectives and their own particular training um, to bear. Some historians are, uh, you know, diplomatic historians, some are economic historians, some are social historians, some are historians of uh, race, class, gender. Um, all of those different types of history um, are going to influence practitioners of history, especially when they approach, you know, such a broad topic as the history of the United States. Right. Well, we'll leave our debates over Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton for another time. <laughs> I, there's no debate. They're both fantastic. They're both great. And you couldn't, you could not have one without the other. They need each other, Tony. That's true. That's they true. need each other. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Next question. So, so how are students taught to think critically rather than just accept what they're told or accept this omniscient voice out there? Uh, in this in this new book, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness? Well, I, I think, you know, it, it goes back again to the way the entire text is structured. I mean, we don't try to make it neat and clean and tie it up with a bow. And that's not what this is about. Um, this is about uh, showing the tensions in history, um, showing the tensions that took place in the past, but also exposing some of the tensions in the present about how the past should be understood and interpreted. Um, so I think in a very intentional way, um, we make it a little bit messy for them. Um, I, I don't mean to say that we make it unclear, right. but, but we point out that there are some uh, matters of history that are up for interpretation. Um, and maybe not all interpretations are created equal. Um, maybe not all can conform as readily to the past as we would like. Um, I, I don't think anyone is saying that, but I think it's really important for people to know that when they read a work of history, um, that it comes from a particular author um, and, and that they bring their perspective to bear. And, you know, maybe sometimes it's okay for students to walk away from, from reading something in our book or from a, a classroom conversation and maybe raise even more questions uh, than answers. Uh, that's what we hope. That's that, the that's, best. That's why we're here. <laughs> Absolutely. Getting Absolutely. them to think about things. Yeah. Some, some of my favorite chapters in Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness were the ones that had me, you know, reaching for, for books um, on my bookshelves or, you know, going to the library um, to, to try to dig deeper. They piqued my curiosity. Um, they, they made me ask new questions. They made me want to learn more. Right. And, and if, a, if a scholar of your caliber can do that, uh, we, we hope that, that we'll, we'll see some students doing that as well, uh, looking for more answers as they're exposed to these new ideas and, and reading some of these things maybe for the first time. So that, that would be great. And, uh, you know, why, why are historical content, the historical thinking skills, uh, the civic components, which we haven't really talked too much about yet, uh, why, why are those components in the book so important for students, especially in, in today's world? Yeah, I mean, every once in a while, you'll see a new study released um, showing how many Americans, they're just being failed by the, the educations that they're receiving or not receiving. I mean, I, I think one of the great challenges um, for America's high school students is that a number of states, you know, don't have uh, as robust a history curriculum as perhaps they should. And you see studies um, revealing that, you know, basic facts of American history are sometimes unknown to large percentages of the population. Um, and, and that's very sad. It's sad not only because we, we'd like to believe that people have a shared understanding of their country's past, um, it's also sad because if you lack that basic understanding, if you lack an understanding of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, um, the, the, the Declaration of Independence, you know, the basic principles upon which America was founded and how those principles have animated debates ever since the founding of the United States, um, you really lack the capacity to sort of in a rich and thoughtful way 
um, engage with your fellow citizens um, in debates of national importance, or even participate um, in a historically minded way as a member of your own community. Um, History is inspiring. I mean, how could you not learn about the life of Frederick Douglass and not come away inspired? You know, he is a role model for all of us. I mean, when you think about it, Frederick Douglass, before he even owned himself, uh, his first possession was, was a book of oratory, which included speeches by George Washington. I mean, he was inspired by history. Um, and when he claimed his own freedom, and when he became an advocate for abolition um, and for liberating others, I mean, that would not have been possible if, if his appreciation of history and the basic principles on which the United States were founded, if those principles didn't inspire him to liberate himself. And, and ultimately, that's what history does. I think it frees us, it frees our minds, and it allows us to promote freedom um, in our communities and uh, through our own lives. As, as, you know, as much as we are um, mere mortals and you know, not Frederick Douglasses or Thomas Jeffersons or Alexander Hamiltons, um, you know, in our own more humble pedestrian ways, we too can make a difference. Right, yeah, it's so inspiring to, to hear you, you, you discuss Douglas that way. And, and, and he's, so, he's, prominently fe- he's, he's prominently featured in the book. And, and so we're, we're, we're so pleased to be able to bring stories like his, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, the, the, the suffragettes, uh, and, and just so many other inspiring stories uh, from the American past to students uh, to, to inspire them. And uh, one more question, Rob, if you, if you would be so kind. Uh, why should teachers and, and even college professors or maybe dual enrollment teachers, um, what, the, those who teach not only high school but also freshman level courses, why, why do you encourage them to adopt life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Well, it gives them more freedom, first of all. I mean, you know, it, it, is, it is calibrated to the AP U.S. history standards. Um, So they could have confidence in that. It will be setting their students up for success. Um, But it allows them um, to customize exactly what they want to deliver to their students. Um, It allows them, let's say that they have a classroom with students of various abilities. I mean, if they want to give a student um, an extra challenge, there's, you know, plenty of that material available for them to pass along. Um, You know, there's the, the basic chapter introduction. In, in each section, which I think is, you know, if, if you only read those, you would have a pretty solid understanding of American history. So it's very customizable. Um, it's, it's not as linear as a typical US history textbook. Um, and I think it's kind of appealing to students. I mean, you have videos embedded within it. Um, you know, so you do, because of this web-based platform, uh, have the opportunity um, to incorporate uh, multimedia experiences for for the students. Um, so I think it it lends itself, you know, to the traditional classroom environment. Um, and obviously, we had no um, inkling that uh, coronavirus would be a thing when we started this project three years ago. Sure. But I, I think you know, for teachers who are thinking about blended environments or even fully remote environments. I think that that this lends itself, uh, you know, very well to it. And you know, I don't want to sound crass, but you know, thanks to the Bill of Rights of Institute and all of its donors, this is free. It's a free resource. So this really lightens the burden on school districts and taxpayers across America. Right. The, uh, they wanted it to be available to all students and all teachers and all school districts across the country. So, yeah, it's a, a great uh, ability we have uh, with their generosity. Rob McDonald of West Point, I can't thank you enough for your incredible contributions to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and and thank you for this conversation today. Tony, thanks so much. It's always great to speak with you, and it's always great to work with the Bill of Rights Institute. Thank you. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, Teachers, uh, students, uh, and college professors can go to our website at billofrightsinstitute.org and can sign up for Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. Thank you.